it's really cold in my house today and I forgot to bring my dressing gown up to put on my lap so if that's not an incentive to get this video done like fairly quickly so that I can be back in the nice warmth of my dressing gown I don't know what else is. Hi everybody I hope that you're all doing really well so today I am back to talk about things that I love in books basically like my bookish buzzwords. I was inspired to do this after seeing Grace from GK Reads do a very similar video and I'm pretty sure that I also saw Rasheen from Sick of Reading's older video with the same concept. I'm always really interested to hear about people's different bookish buzzwords Words, different aspects, different plot points of books that aren't, you know, like big sweeping things like genre that just really appeal to you. That every single time you hear that that is part of a book, you're like, Ooh, me. I have a little list. I've amassed a little collection of my bookish buzzwords. And yeah, we're just going to go through them today. And also do let me know if you'd be interested in the opposite version of this video. If you'd be interested in hearing my anti-bookish buzzwords, things that really turn me off a book. Because I think it's just as fun to hear about the things that people aren't interested in as the things that they are interested in. So two big bookish buzzwords for me. <laughs> love the alliteration there, um, is that I love to read books that are character focused and relationships focused. You'll often hear me say that a lot, but I don't really mind how plotty or action packed a book is. I don't really care about the writing style, you know, how beautiful and lyrical the writing is. What I really care the most about are the characters. I like to see strong character development and I like to read stories where people's relationships are like the focal point. And I feel like in so many ways, strong characters and strong relationships can really lift a kind of slow, dry plot. Meanwhile, I could be reading a book that's really action-packed, that has beautiful writing, but if I do not care about any of the characters, then it's never going to be a five-star book for me. And I think it's just, I like learning about people. It's one of the reasons that I do enjoy biographies. I like learning about people's lives. I like seeing conversations between different people. I like learning about different characters' interests, their quirks, funny little personality tidbits. And when I say that I like relationship-focused narratives, I'm not just talking romantic, I'm also talking platonic, family. I like characters that really feel like they bounce off each other, rather than having characters that are basically just their to serve a plot function. A book that I can think of straight away where yes there is like a larger plot going on but really it's the characters and their relationships that are the focal point is Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. <laughs> when will I ever shut up about Les Mis? Obviously you've got these big like historic moments happening in the background simmering away. You've got the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 and of course the big set piece which is the 1832 June Rebellion. And I feel like that's often the first thing that people think of when they think of Les Mis are these big historic set pieces. But really when you actually get down to reading the book they're actually not that important. The whole way through what is driving the plot of Les Mis are these relationships and the historic set pieces are just kind of happening around them. Something that I actually absolutely love in books but I do not see anywhere near as much as I would like to is image integration. Particularly images very much integrated into history non-fiction. I adore history that has lots and lots of images and I'm not just talking about like big globs of photos in the middle of books where most of the book is just like text 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 but then you'll have like the odd photo section. I am talking things like this where the images are very much integrated in with the text. So I've got things like The Pocket, A Hidden History of Women's Lives. The book that really cemented to me how much I love this is Medieval Bodies, as well as Georgina's World by Amanda Foreman, which is the illustrated version of her biography, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire. I do understand why not all history is done this way. It probably is quite expensive to do, but I just think in terms of opening up these worlds, images, photos, paintings, pictures of primary evidence just do so much to open up these worlds, especially if you are the kind of person who can't really imagine things on the page. I feel like it really helps to close the gap between things that happened in the past and now. And I want more of it, please. The next thing that I'm going to talk about in terms of things that I love in books is the pace at which I like my books to be. I've always said that I am somebody who prefers like a slow to medium pace plot. As I've said previously, I'm not really a fan of like a big plotty book. I'm not a fan of action. So I'm quite happy a lot of the time if the book meanders and like takes its time. I remember reading The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel which a lot of people had criticised for being like just a little bit too slow and there being like too many of these big reflective passages when not much is really happening but like Thomas Cromwell himself is having like big brain waves. Whereas I absolutely loved those slower sections and I thought they did so much to add to his character. And I think that's really where I draw the line because in the past I have read very slow paced books and I've hated how slow they are. But I think what really saves them once again is if the characters and their relationships are really strong, I will not mind if we spend like a little bit of time just getting to know them rather than in the action. My next bookish buzzword is that I love books about books. I love books that are literature focused and that is regardless of whether it is fiction or non-fiction. My first real foray into that with fiction was of course The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak, which is one of my favourite books. Just from the books that I have to hand, the books that I brought with me from home to Oxford, I have Dear Reader by Kathy Rensenbrink. I have The Reader and the 627. I have Off the Shelf, A Celebration of Books 
bookshops in verse, the seven kinds of people that you find in bookshops by Sean Blythell, the social life of books, reading together in the 18th century home by Abigail Williams, and the uncommon reader by Alan Bennett. Safe to say books about books is something that really appeals to me. And I think part of it is honestly just that it's quite a nice little like pat on the shoulder. When you're reading a book that is about books and the joy of books and why books are so fantastic, it's kind of like somebody is pepping you up being like, come on, keep on reading. This is why we read, yay. And you know, I am very much a words of affirmation person. I like being told that I'm doing a good job and to keep doing what I'm doing. For my next couple of bookish buzzwords, I wanted to think about romance. What kind of romance do I like to read about? Because I'm definitely like, I'm not the biggest romance reader, but I definitely like a rom-com and I do like a romance plot. I'm one of those people. I never really understand when people say, oh, I was reading this book and I really enjoyed it, but then there was a romance plot. Oh, I'm just like, oh, people don't like romance? All right, okay, fine. I'm just like, you're just selling this book to me. I love a good romance. And I had originally written down that I like the friends to lovers trope, where you've got two characters that are pretty much like best friends and then slowly they start developing feelings for each other. And I'm like, oh. And then when I was trying to think of actual examples of this, I was coming up kind of short. And I think part of it is that I think this is something that works much better in longer series, whether that is book or television. An example that I can think of from books is definitely Ron and Hermione in Harry Potter, which was my original OTP as a teenager. In TV, I'm definitely much more of a Monica and Chandler girl than I am a Ross and Rachel girl. And I think the reason that I like the friends to lovers trope when I do come across it in fiction is because, you know, that's very much how I would like romance to be. I feel like good romantic relationships are built upon friendship rather than it being like, this is the person that I'm in a romantic relationship and I can't behave around them the same same way that I would my friends. I, de I don't think that's a good basis for a relationship, she says as somebody who has been single her entire life. Well, what do I know? <laughs> but that's really more of a reflection of what I would enjoy like in real life. But I've come to realise from looking at all of the books and the relationships that I've enjoyed in fiction, what I really like, what, what is the real bookish buzzword for me? I'm a big fan of like dislike or hate to lovers. I used to refer to it more as enemies to lovers. However, I have had it pointed out to me recently that the things that I considered to be enemies to lovers, they're not really enemies because like nobody wants to kill each other. It's more of a thing in like sci-fi and fantasy where you've got like two assassins who are assigned to kill each other but then they fall in love and I've, I've not really read anything like that but I've read many many a book where there is a romance subplot where the two people cannot stand each other and then slowly but surely they realise how wrong they were about the other person and they fall in love. And I don't understand why I enjoy this so much because like that I would find that so stressful in real life. I'm a very non-confrontational person. I do not understand people who go out of their way to have fights with people. I just want to get on with everybody please. I don't like bickering but in fiction, sign me up, love it. Of course you've got the classic red, white and royal blue where Prince Henry of England and first son Alex do not like each other. Then they start to get to know each other and become friends but very quickly it is clear that they are very attracted to each other. I recently read The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren where you've got two characters who hate each other but then start to fall in love. I would argue you've even got a little bit of that in The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue between Addie and Luke. How far you could say that their relationship actually goes all the way into them being properly in love with each other. They still dislike each other very much but there's clearly an attraction there. And I think it is purely that the emotions that are involved in the dislike to lovers, hate to lovers is so intense. You're swinging from one extreme to another. And because I am somebody who is very much a character focused, relationships focused person, you get to really go on a journey with these characters in a way that's just not quite as intense when you're reading like friends to lovers because they already kind of like each other. And it's always a very subtle, gradual change. And yeah, fiction is just a way of experiencing that without having to actually go through all the drama of actually going through that. Not for me, thank you, but quite happy to read it in books. And Another thing is that I really like reading Christmas scenes in a book. I like seeing people getting together with their family and celebrating and having lots of delicious food. We know from my Vlogmas videos that I'm a big Christmas girl, so yeah. It just, it just makes me happy. I don't need the entire book to be Christmas, but like a little, a little taste of it is always nice. Another thing that I really love reading about in books is education, particularly like historic education. And that ties into another thing that I really like in books, which is that I really love like school and university settings. I think I mentioned it in my accomplished woman tag that I'm always really fascinated by what different time periods consider to be like an educated person and learning about the kind of things that would be on like a historic school curriculum. And I think part of it is just me feeling like, oh, I want to learn all of these things. And do I ever have the time to? Maybe not. It's one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated with the Tudor period, where suddenly you have this big influx of like Renaissance influence, where you suddenly have like this proliferation of like very educated scholars talking about classical texts. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to get out of it, but I just find it so interesting. So something that you will probably have picked up upon is that I love history. And within history, my real, my real sweet spot, something that I love learning about is queens. I do generally like my history like to be fairly women focused anyway, 
way, but I, I just find queens so fascinating. I think it's because I do find royalty fascinating. So you kind of mix women and royalty, smush it together, what do you get? Queens. Once again, if we are just looking at like my current TBR pile, we have Catherine Parr, the sixth wife and queen of Henry VIII. We've got The Other Boleyn Girl by Philippa Gregory, which is of course about Anne Boleyn and Mary Boleyn. Wife After Wife, which is a retelling of The Six Wives of Henry VIII. We have Marie Antoinette by Antonia Fraser. And Uncrowned Queen, The Fateful Life of Margaret Beaufort, Tudor Matriarch by Nicola Tallis. Two of my favourite history podcasts are Queen's Podcast and then also the Queens of England podcast. I just find these women so fascinating and often more fascinating than the men that they were wives to. My next bookish buzzword, which has been something that has been growing over the past year, is retellings of Greek mythology. This was very much spurred on by rereading The Song of Achilles last year. And I don't know what happened. I reread that book and suddenly I am like head over heels in love with Greek mythology and reading more retellings. And something that I was actually talking about to one of my friends is that she prefers to read like modern Greek myth retellings, whereas I prefer it to be set in the time. I prefer like direct myth retellings. So of course we've got Song of Achilles, also got Circe by Madeline Miller, A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes. On my TBR right now, I've got The Children of Jocasta. And I also have just ordered a book called Ithaca Forever, which is a translated fiction, a retelling of the Odyssey and kind of basically like the, I think it's meant to be the events after the events of the Odyssey and a reimagining of the relationship between Odysseus and Penelope. And I'm a massive fan of Odysseus as a character. So I'm really interested to see this different take on him. Another bookish trope that I love that I have done an entire video on is personifications of death and deals with death. I'm not gonna lie to you. I do not know where this interest in death comes from. I like to think of myself as being a pretty positive, like happy-go-lucky, like Disney princess kind of person, you know, all singing, all dancing. And then suddenly out of nowhere, I'm like, oh, but also death. I just find it interesting. I will link my video down below where I do talk about this, but also since doing that video, I've picked up Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death by Selena Godin, where we have a female personification of death. And I am all about this. My penultimate little bookish buzzword that I would like to talk to you about is something that Melina from Melina Reads actually picked up upon in my three books to understand me video, which is that when it comes to historical fiction, I much prefer historical fiction where it is being told from a figure or a character that we already know that already exists in our current world rather than fictional people living in a historical setting, if that makes sense. So for example, out of the historical fiction that I read last year, you would see things like Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, where we're following the life of Thomas Cromwell, somebody who existed in history, who we know, who we have records for, rather than a completely fictionalized character. But also one of my favorite books from last year was The Other Bennet Sister by Janice Hadlow, which was a retelling of Pride and Prejudice from the perspective of Mary Bennet. So we're seeing characters that we already know, but seeing them reimagined. And I don't really know what it is, but yeah, I do tend to like seeing characters that I already know, that I have a familiarity with. I don't know if part of it is just the comfort of knowing what to expect from a character, and sometimes like the delight of seeing a subversion to that character. So once again, on my TV are currently of people who fit into that wife of a wife, the other bling girl. I've noticed some of the historical fiction that I have on my shelves that I am like less inclined to pick up are books where it's completely fictionalized characters, people who either did not exist in the past as we know it, and have never existed previously in fiction, such historical fiction as The Familiars by Stacey Halls or Now We Shall Be Entirely Free by Andrew Miller. I have these books because they're historical fiction and I want to read them and I want to see what I think of them, but I'm less inclined to pick them up than I am at things like Children of Jocasta or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which is a Hamlet retelling. And I don't know, anybody else like that? I'm starting to think maybe it's just a really lazy part of my brain that doesn't want to have to learn about new characters. <laughs> it, might, it might just be that. And then the last thing that I really love in books relates to settings. And previously I've mentioned, I really like schools and universities, but another setting that I really, really enjoy is a city setting. I feel like in both real life and in fiction, I am much more of a city girl than I am a country girl. And I think that part of that is because of how I grew up. I grew up in West Yorkshire. And whilst I will always maintain that West Yorkshire is not just farms, I do have to concede, there are a lot of farms in West Yorkshire. I would often complain to people, especially at university when they were like, oh, you just live on a farm then, don't you? I'd be like, no, 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 no. I do not live on a farm. I live adjacent to farms. I used to tell people that, no, 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 Halifax isn't that rural. It's actually quite an industrial area, I'll have you know. But then it really hit home for me just how rural where I grew up is compared to York when I came home from university and started crying because I saw a sheep for the first time in three months. I had not seen a sheep for the entire time I'd been at university, whereas I had been very used to seeing sheep pretty much every day at home. And I don't know, it got me, it got me. So, uh, 
do with that information what you will. But I have always wanted to live much closer to the city. I think it's because I am very much like an indoor person and if I am going to go out it is to do things like shopping or theatre, going to the cinema, that kind of thing. Much more so than like going outdoors in the big wide world. I am very much a person who like I go outside to get back into an inside place and so I'd always be much more excited to read a book where it is a city narrative, where it feels like there's so much going on. Cities just come to life in fiction in a way that rural settings just don't, they just seem kind of blah and boring to me and maybe that's just because I've grown up around it. It's not as appealing, it's not as exciting and I've always just wanted to be a lot closer to what I feel like the action is in a city than I used to be. I like seeing characters on public transport, I like seeing them in shops, in theatres, in cinemas, in the restaurants. I find that hustle and bustle really exciting in a way that I just don't with rural settings. Which once again, come to think of it, is probably why I am less inclined to pick these two books up because I think they've got much calmer, more country or seaside settings and it's, it's just not a buzzword for me. It's not something that I think oh yes gotta read that now. But anyway yes that was my very very long list of bookish buzzwords. Like I say do let me know if you'd be interested in seeing the opposite version of this video where I talk about things that just turn me off a book instantly. And do let me know in the comment section your bookish buzzwords, the things that really light you up when you hear them in a book. I would love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, bye!